Hey folks, Jeff here at Back to Country. Well, spring is upon us and the bees are getting busy, so a lot of people are asking questions about what it takes to get started in beekeeping. So today we're gonna cover just some of the basics, talk about equipment, uh, knowledge, and, and uh, what you need to get started. We'll talk about how to get started on the cheap or how you can spend a fortune. Which one you do, that's up to you. Let's get started. So first thing you need is knowledge. You got to know what you're doing with bees. It's not so simple just to get some bees and let them do their thing. You kind of got to take care of them. Uh, you're taking bees from the wild and you're transferring them into a more controlled environment and with that comes a bit of responsibility. So gain knowledge. There's really you know, a few different ways you can get that knowledge. One of which is watching videos, which you're doing now. Another one is to get some books and read. Uh, here's a few books that I happen to like the practical beekeeper beekeeping for dummies and the beekeepers handbook these are all good books and probably available through your local library so if you need to save some money or want to save some money there's a great way to do it you might even be able to find beekeeping books on uh, Kindle Unlimited or any of those kind of things uh, to save money so get some books though and read up and you know learn about the bees the other thing and probably one of the more important is to find a mentor find somebody who's uh, got the experience that they can share with you a lot of times just going through a hive one time with somebody that's knowledgeable can help uh, tremendously so uh, whether you take a class or join a bee local beekeeping club or just find somebody who keeps bees to help mentor you and kind of let you tag along with them uh, that experience is, is very valuable, so uh, pursue that knowledge. Next thing we're going to talk about is just some of the equipment you need. And uh, you know, the bottom line when it comes to equipment, first thing you need to do is protect yourself. Nobody likes to uh, get stung, especially when you're new to beekeeping. But bottom line is if you're going to keep bees, you will get stung, so don't be afraid of it. The truth is that as you get stung, as long as you're not uh, allergic to it, uh, you do develop kind of an immunity to it. And although the first time you get stung, it might burn a little or whatever, uh, the more you get stung, that burn goes away. And after a little bit, in all honesty, you, you don't even feel it anymore. So a lot of times I get stung when I'm working bees and don't even realize I've been stung. And until after I'm all done, I might see a little welt or something on my hand and realize, oh, I got stung. But uh, it's just part of beekeeping so don't be afraid of it but you do want to protect yourself so here in san antonio we tend to have some very aggressive bees because they get that africanized strain in them and uh, man when you're working mean bees you do not want to be without a suit so here's a suit that uh, i'm kind of fond of this is this is my suit and uh, it's made by the ultra breeze company the cool thing about this suit is they invented this uh, ventilated suit and what it is is it's two layers of mesh and then in between there's this grid type material that's kind of beaded in the middle and what that does is it provides some space so that a bee stinger can't reach through the material and sting you. So this is really the closest thing there is to bee proof, but I will tell you it's not 100%. If I push my finger against, it does compress and a bee stinger could go through that. So no such thing as 100% bee proof or bee sting proof suit, but this is about as close as you get to it. The other good thing about this suit is because it's all mesh, it's ventilated, allows the air to uh, go through, and down here in this Texas heat, boy, that's vital. But the one thing to understand about this suit is this is probably the number one best suit on the market. And it's really targeted for commercial beekeepers, professionals, folks that are serious about it, because it is not cheap. This suit here goes for about $260, uh, but it has some nice features like full leg zippers, so it's easy to get on. Uh, it's got a good long front zipper, and of course the, the hood is also solidly zipped on it's all metal zippers and uh, velcro and everything in any of your fastening points so everything is 100 percent sealed up and really uh, a good quality suit um, but 
like I say, with quality, you will pay for it. So that's just a, a nice thing. That's not a mandatory thing as far as spending that much on a suit. You really need to know that you're serious about it before you do. Now this suit is another uh, vintage suit. This one is by Eco Keeper, but there's a million of these suits out on the market that are vented and it's really a copy of the other one if you look it also has the same thing mesh on both sides with the grid material in the middle and uh, it provides that same space so that uh, you can avoid getting stung uh, but different features for example these legs uh, they've got short like six inch zippers still gets over your boots but not the same as being able to unzip the entire leg you know so there's some small differences, but overall, this bee suit is very effective. It's vented just like the other one, so it's good in the, the heat, and uh, it's a fraction of the cost. These things, uh, I've seen them as cheap as about maybe $75. I know I paid less than $100 for these things on sale. If you shop the sales, if you use uh, Amazon, eBay, shop around, look for vented suits, and uh, you can find a good deal on a suit and not spend a fortune. Now when it comes to suits, uh, it doesn't have to be vented. You can also get just like a regular cotton suit that uh, I've seen those things. The other day I was looking at Amazon and I saw a suit that was called an ultralight suit and it was some kind of mesh material or something. But the key thing was it was $139 if I remember correctly, but it had a coupon, digital coupon for $100 off. So you pay like $40 for a suit. So there are good deals out there to be had, and you can uh, literally get a suit probably on the on the low end at maybe like 30 bucks. Uh, so you do not have to spend a fortune in order to get a, a bee suit that'll do the job. Another suit is just a jacket. This suit here is same ventilated material. It's all built the same, good hood, uh, but it's just a jacket. And... Uh, when you're a little more confident, you know your bees are a little more tame, maybe you don't need to put on the whole suit. Generally, bees are gonna hit you in the head area, so the, the hood takes care of that. But uh, the jacket just gives you a little more confidence of the upper body that you're not gonna get stung. And these things run, uh, I think for the, the Ultra Breeze one, it might be like $165, but uh, they're, I've seen them for, you know, probably like 50, 60 bucks, maybe even less. So again, shop around. And if you don't need a, a suit, then, you know, you can go to the lowest model, which is just a, a hood. And uh, this model here is just a, a beekeeping hat, you know, safari type hat with a, a veil that goes over the top of that. And, uh, you know, that works just fine. If you're just running out real, real quick to check on the bees or whatever, or if your bees are real tame, feel confident that you don't need an entire suit this does the job the key thing to remember about covering up is that uh, you know bees tend to go for the face uh, if you think about tender areas on predators whether it be bears raccoons skunks etc uh, some of those animals their tender areas are their face uh, and their belly areas so you know don't go shirtless and <laughs> don't uh, go without a, a hood because you definitely don't want that and if you get into Africanized bees There's been stories of where uh, they actually try to fly down people's uh, Throat and get into their windpipe and stuff to sting them. So you definitely don't want that but uh, cover up protect yourself and uh, You know you figure out what's right for you The next thing you're gonna need is some good gloves uh, there are uh, hundreds if not millions of, of different types of bee gloves on the market uh, you know here's a set that's a real thick leather heavy duty and they're vented I'm not sure that this vented material actually does anything because when you put this over the top of your bee suit uh, I don't actually feel any wind or anything flowing through there but maybe it does I don't know but uh, it's not that noticeable so it really doesn't matter if you get vented or not most bee gloves do have some sleeves on them that pull up just to kind of make that seal that much better and, and cover up your arms a little better. And of course, if you're not wearing a bee suit and you're just wearing a hood, then that extended arm is, is really nice. Here's another model that uh, these are lighter gloves, so easier to feel through. And uh, 
you know, just a nylon type sleeves, but they do the job. The bottom line is, uh, whether it's a thinner glove or a thicker glove, bees can sting you through it. I get stung through my gloves regularly, so uh, good thick gloves are nice and they will protect you more than thinner gloves, but uh, if bees are going to get you, they're typically that's where they're going to get you is, is in the hands. So a good pair of gloves is valuable, but you know, the thicker the gloves, you give up some of that tactile feeling. Uh, you also uh, sometimes, you know, harder to grab things, whatever, and that's where some of your other tools can, can be more valuable. Uh, but as far as gloves, you don't have to buy the most expensive pair out there. You can get gloves, you know, as cheap as five bucks. Uh, again, just shop around and, and look for a decent pair of gloves and then kind of go from there whether you like them or not and, and uh, you know, try different ones out. Some people just use uh, the latex nitrile gloves or whatever and, and they're comfortable with that. They, you, so you don't have to uh, wear the thickest gloves out there. So let's talk a little bit about some of the tools. So probably your most important tool that you use is a bee smoker and pretty much all bee smokers are the same you got this type design uh, or a dome type it really doesn't matter there's not much difference in them uh, pretty much all of them have a, a bellows which blows air through the fuel material and comes out the top I take a little dowel and uh, clean it up to put in there so that I can plug it off so when I'm done I put the plug in it and that kind of chokes out the fire and helps me save on fuel that I don't burn up my fuel every single time. Uh, so that's just a, a thing that I do, but not necessary. As far as smokers, I mean, you can get into expensive smokers that have electric bellows on them and crazy stuff that'll, you know, maybe run you a hundred bucks. Uh, or you can probably pay, you know, 10 to 15, maybe 20 bucks for just a decent smoker. All of these smokers, probably less than 30 bucks each, uh, but I've seen them out there for probably, uh, you know, around 20 bucks. So smokers do not have to be expensive. When it comes to fuel for smokers, uh, fuel is pretty easy. What I like to use is I take old burlap bags and I cut them up and just use pieces of burlap. Uh, burlap burns good and slow, long, it smokes good. And the thing is, it's cheap. I got these burlap bags from a uh, store that sells coffee and uh, they roast their own beans and everything so they buy beans in 50 pound sacks. They come in burlap sacks and uh, they sold me the bags for like 10 cents each so uh, very cheap. But you can also just uh, scrape up some dead leaves and stuff around the yard and use that as well. You do not have to uh, use burlap or or any of the other fancy materials I mean some people use uh, wood pellets for like smokers or, or pellet stoves uh, other people use uh, compressed cotton uh, there there is a lot of different uh, materials out there that you can spend a lot of money on but the reality is you don't have to you can use the uh, cheap free stuff pine needles work great you know just grab some leaves under a tree a few sticks whatever and, and uh, that does the job next to your uh, smoker the next most important tool that you'll have is a hive tool now this particular hive tool uh, is my favorite it's got a J hook on it which is great for getting down under uh, frames and breaking them free uh, it's got a standard bend on it, 90 degree bend, which you can put in between frames and give it a little twist to get them. You can put it under to lift. Uh, you know, the other flat end, you break your box apart when they're stuck together. I mean, there are many, many, many uses for the hive tool. And, you know, you really need one if you're gonna keep bees. The good news is these aren't expensive. I think I saw one of these on Amazon for like seven bucks. So not an expensive piece of equipment, but again, when it comes to equipment, shop around, check eBay, check uh, all over online, Amazon, etc., and, and uh, you can buy this stuff uh, and get good deals on it cheap, and uh, there's no need to spend a fortune. Now the good news is, is everything that I've shown you so far is basically what you need uh, to get started, your basic tools. 
The next tools I'm gonna show you are nice to have maybe, but you don't have to have them. Uh, some of them I rarely even use. This uh, B box right here, this toolbox I built myself. It's just an old uh, nucleus hive that I put a lid on and a bottom on and uh, have made it work for me. On the top I had screwed some old magnets out of some hard drives uh, that used to attach my tools. And for me, that's really nice because when I need a tool, it's easy to just grab it off the top of the box and then throw it back on there. This is another hive tool that's just a simple basic. It's called a Big Tex. That's probably why I bought it because Tex for Texas. But, uh, you know, it, it does the job also. There are many, many, many different ones out there, even different colors. For some of you women, if you like them pink or whatever, they got them out there. You can find them. Uh, this particular deal I built but you can buy these things and this just hangs on the side of your hive box and then it allows you to hang frames uh, in between while you're working it's really just a convenient thing uh, you can just as easily set them on the ground and I often do uh, on the other side of the box this is a, a frame lifter you put it in there and squeeze it, grab onto a frame to pull it out and, and inspect it. I'll be honest, I rarely use this thing, but on occasion I do, most of the time I don't. Uh, on this side, we got the bee brush. Now this bee brush has many purposes, but number one, it pisses off the bees. When you pick up a frame of, of uh, honey or whatever and you're trying to get bees off it and you start brushing them off, yeah, that doesn't make them happy, so they're gonna start attacking you after that. But in reality, sometimes you do need to get bees off of a frame, and this comes in really handy. But you know what? You can also shake the bees off real easy. You can smoke them off. You can just blow on them, and they'll fly away because for whatever reason, they don't like the carbon uh, dioxide or whatever that's in our breath. So uh, nice to have things, not mandatory. Here I've got a... Uh, uh, Magnifier. Magnifying glass is something that uh, you would probably normally never find on somebody's bee box, but on my bee box it comes in handy for a couple of reasons. Number one, I can't always see that good, and if the lighting isn't perfect, uh, sometimes I just want to get a closer look at a, a beehive. This is just a cheap kid's magnifying glass. I think it was like a 10 times magnifier, and then it's got a bigger one there, but the other great thing about this is it's great for teaching because eggs uh, in a honeycomb or, or brood comb can be really hard to see. And so the first time when somebody new is, is looking at a beehive and you're doing an inspection with them and you want to show them what the eggs look like, a lot of times it's really hard for them to see them. But if you can magnify it and show it to them and then once they've seen it, it's easy. Uh, it's just that first time that it, it can be a little bit challenging to recognize it. So I use that for teaching as well. Other than that, on the inside, I've got, you know, burlap and different things like that that I use, uh, which really isn't important for this video. Uh, so next thing, let's talk a little bit about hives. There are many different kinds of beehives, and you can spend a fortune on them, uh, or you can save money and do stuff on the cheap. So these hives here are what's called Langstroth hives, and they're probably the most common beehives uh, that you'll find. And really what the differences between them are just size. So this hive right here is commonly referred to as a nucleus hive. And the reason it's a nucleus hive is because this is a starter hive. When you do splits and things like that, we use these hives to start bees uh, it's only hold five frames and a frame is basically what you the bees will build the honeycomb on this or burr comb or not burr comb but honeycomb or brood comb and so we pull these out and, and you look at them and inspect them and that's where you're going to find all the, the stuff in a beehive here's an old piece that's got a little bit built on it but uh, it's kind of tore up from bugs and stuff anyway uh, so this is a nucleus hive And like I say the only difference between that and these hives is really the size this Fret right here holds five frames and these hold ten frames uh, But if I was going to do it over I probably would not 
do this same kind of setup and I'll get into that in a minute. So let's talk about the different pieces to the hive. So on the top, of course, you find what we call the top cover. This particular type of top cover is called a telescoping top cover. And it's because it sits down over uh, the side, telescopes down over the sides, you know, and that's how it covers it. Uh, it has a piece of, you know, aluminum sheeting, like um, flashing on top just to protect it from the weather. And then the next thing you have is, is what's called an inner cover. Uh, this inner cover basically just provides separation between the top cover uh, and the, the bees themselves. It does have a hole in it for air to vent through as well as bees will come through there and they'll go out this little opening here so it provides another entrance and exit to the hive. Um, take off the top cover and look inside and of course we normally would have frames so this particular box on the top is what's called a honey super and this is used specifically for honey i mean when you're uh, got a honey flow going on and it's time for the bees to start making lots of honey and they're uh, into surplus which is what you want the surplus honey is basically the honey that is goes above and beyond what they need to survive the winter and that's the honey that you can harvest if you harvest too much honey you will literally kill your bees because when the winter comes on they use that honey to survive because there's no flowers blooming or anything providing any nectar so if they don't have those food sources for the winter they will literally starve to death and die so uh, it's important that you learn uh, how much honey your bees need to keep to survive the winter and if they run out you need to recognize that they're out and and feed them uh, to keep them going this of course is a, a frame that's shorter if you compare this to the frames in the hive you can see the difference in size so there's the the difference these are a lot deeper and so these boxes are 10 frame Langstroth deep boxes and deep because they're they're deeper and so these boxes are typically used as what we call brood boxes and that's where the uh, queen and the other bees will do all their activity as far as she will lay all her eggs uh, in those brood frames they will also store some honey there and some pollen and what they call bee bread to feed those young larvae and uh, that is where all the action happens in the hive. And when you decide how many boxes you need based on where you're at and what they need to survive the winter, uh, then that determines how many of these boxes you have on a hive. I typically keep two uh, of these deep brood boxes in order to ensure that my bees always have enough to get through the winter. And San Antonio uh, or really anywhere in Texas does not have extreme winters. So that should really suffice for anywhere in Texas. Uh, and a lot of the other the rest of the country as well this particular piece of hardware is called a queen excluder so if you put this over the brood boxes what that does is these gaps are too small for the queen to fit through so the worker bees are smaller and those worker bees can get through and uh, come up into the the honey super and do their work but the queen cannot which means she can't let come up and lay eggs or anything in that honey super some folks use these and some folks don't uh, I honestly usually don't use them because I've noticed that my bees are pretty good about uh, not the queen doesn't go up into the honey supers and, and uh, lay eggs I've never had that problem so I just haven't used them much uh, getting on to the other parts of the hive like I said we got two deep brood boxes the other part is the bottom board and so this is uh, basically a board that everything sits on. You can see their screen in the bottom. And uh, you can leave it open like that to provide plenty of ventilation. This piece is, is uh, what we call an entrance reducer. And so it's got two different sizes here and a little, little one here. So depending on how you turn it, that's going to determine the size of the entrance. And what that does is it allows a hive... Uh, a smaller entrance so that they don't have to protect as much area so if we leave it open like this you have this entire 
front open, which means that invading bees from other hives that want to come in and try to steal honey from the hive, uh, that's more area they can get in, which means the bees have to protect more area. Not to mention other bugs and pests that come in. Uh, this just kind of helps out. So I like to use entrance reducers uh, to keep the entrance smaller and manageable. This right here uh, is part of a pest management system and this particular board uh, is commonly referred to, a lot of people call it a mite board. And it just provides a grid so when you're treating for pests, another thing that you need to learn is understanding pests and pest management. Uh, two of the biggest pests that we deal with is the Varroa mite, uh, which the Varroa mite attaches itself to the bees and can carry disease and everything. It can shorten the life of the bees and uh, that causes a lot of problems. Uh, but we do uh, count, so you can look at this board and, and uh, count in a grid square how many mites there are and it kind of gives you an idea of how bad your mite problem is uh, during treatment. So. Uh, that's what these boards are, but in Texas, I leave them off 99% of the time because with all the heat we get down here, the bees uh, need that ventilation in the hive. So we typically just use the bottom board wide open like that. It's not difficult. Everything just sets lined up right on top. Uh, even with uh, Texas storms i've never had a hive blow over but if you do get really bad wind storms you can uh, strap these things down typically when they're full they're really heavy and so i said earlier that if i had it to do over again i wouldn't use this so this langstroth this is a 10 frame langstroth they also come in a, a seven frame version now the smaller version the benefit of it is it weighs less uh, one of these boxes when it's full if you got a, a deep and it's full of honey It's gonna weigh uh, around 90 pounds or more. It is really heavy. So these boxes uh, Can be difficult to move when they're full of, of uh, bees and, and uh, honey, etc. So uh, I would use a smaller type, but This is a Langstroth hive now. There's other versions now for example they have one that's called a long hive which basically does a horizontal version of this hive instead of stacking upward it goes across so if you imagine three of these boxes sitting next to each other you would have a long version and that's why they call it a long hive or a horizontal hive and basically it uses the exact same frames and it's easy to build so if you want to save money I would absolutely use the long hive uh, because it's a lot easier to build yourself and uh, uh, so far everything I've seen they work great and in reality uh, bees will build where they have to build so uh, they're just as happy with it so if I had it to do today and I was starting over I would probably go with a, a, a long hive as a kind of a cheaper option these boxes uh, you know I've finished these myself I buy just the, uh, the unassembled parts and pieces. So the frames that I use, I buy them all unassembled. I basically put everything together myself. I, I do the finish work as far as uh, painting them. I build my own frames from the same unassembled pieces. So let's talk about frames for a second. There's a lot of different types of frames that you can get. You notice this one has a black center. This one has a yellow center. Uh, I don't know that the bees care what color it is. They're basically the same. It's a plastic frame that has the bee pattern or the cell pattern already on it. And it's even got a little wax rolled over it. So the bees uh, tend to take to it really well. But uh, that's, you know, a more expensive option and it's less natural. Uh, I kind of like to let the bees uh, do as much naturally as they can. So this is the same kind of frame but instead of that plastic piece put in it it's got just some uh, tongue depressors that are put in there uh, to provide a guide so that uh, the bees can can build comb on that guide now additionally uh, some folks instead of that they'll put you can buy pieces of uh, wax that's printed out that acts as a guide and they'll put that in there uh, but I am more fond of this frame right here 
this frame is what's called a foundationless frame and it's got this ridge cut into it uh, so when they make it they build this ridge onto it and what that does is that gives provides a guide and it gives something for the bees to attach their comb to and they will literally build comb and fill this whole thing up and it is just perfect and beautiful and these are less expensive because you're not paying for that plastic center or a wax center or anything else and the bees love it it works great so my recommendation is to buy foundationless frame with the uh, beveled center to act as a guide. Now I said that I was going to tell you all the options you got and uh, tell you how you could spend a fortune as well. So now I'm going to tell you an option for a honey super of how you can spend a fortune. So this right here is a flow hive, flow frame. Uh, so the only difference between this and uh, a regular hive, it's a Langstroth configuration. Uh, you do not have to go out and buy a flow hive that you're paying for the rest of these boxes uh, more than double what you'd pay for them regularly. If you want to spend that money, more power to you. But they will sell you just the box for the, the flow frames and the uh, the frames themselves and that's what I would recommend you do in order to save money and uh, do it a little cheaper so some of the cool things about this uh, these things have nice little observation windows and stuff so that you can look but this is the back side of the the box the top comes out This is a brand new one, so, oh, that's nice. So my finish uh, has stuck a little bit. Wow, that's not good. So I gotta pop that thing out because the, uh, the finish has dried it together because I haven't used it before. This is a brand new one. But let me pull one of these frames out here and, and show you what they look like. So this is the frame itself, and you can see that uh, it's got plastic comb already built. And basically, uh, each of these is a different piece. You can see where they're separated. This wire holds them together. And what this allows is that these combs, you put a key in the top, and they move up and down. And, and by moving half of it or one side of the comb up or down, it breaks that comb and gives a channel for the honey to flow down. The honey flows down into this bottom channel and this little uh, thing cap comes out and you got another little piece that you stick in there and the honey just flows right out. Uh, we've got a video out, a couple of them on uh, how to do a harvest with these, but uh, you know, this is a brilliant idea and uh, it really does make beekeeping simple as far as the harvest itself the only difference between this and a regular hive is the process of extraction when you extract honey using regular frames like i've showed you already uh, you typically use an extractor so you remove the capping from the top you put it in the extractor and it spins at high speed uh, and the centrifugal force basically throws the honey out of the, the frames onto the side of the, the machine and it drops down into the bottom and, and then you do it. Some people also will just take all the comb, cut it out and, and squeeze it and run it through a, a screen to filter the debris out of it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to harvest your honey. This is a very simple method. If you're only gonna have one or two hives, this ain't a bad way to go, uh, but it is not cheap. These things are, are uh, I can't even remember how much they are just for the flow frame itself or the, this one box. Uh, it's, you know, probably around three, four hundred dollars. It's, it's not cheap. So if you're going to have more than one or two hives, definitely that would be what I call cost prohibitive. And, uh, you know, Unless you got money to spend, it, it probably would not be my recommendation because it is so costly. 
but it, it's a great piece of technology and uh, I hope they continue to advance the capability and, and even make it better than what it is in the future. So that covers uh, the basic beehive, um, some of the basic equipment that you need. Uh, like I said, there's so much to learn. Uh, that's really the key. You gotta learn at a minimum. You need to understand uh, bees in their life cycle. You need to understand um, pests, disease, pest management. Uh, you know, those are some of the critical, critical things. And then you have to learn how to do an inspection and what are you looking for when you do an inspection. If you can just learn those basic things, uh, from there, you'll learn more as you go, but that is enough to get started and to be confident that you can raise bees effectively. Now, what you don't control is the amount of resources that you have in your area. So you can look at your yard and go, oh, I got flowers in my yard, that's plenty. But the reality is in order for bees to make enough honey, I mean, we're talking that one bee in its lifetime might make uh, you know a fourth of a teaspoon or something. I mean, it's a very small minuscule amount of honey that one bee makes and he visits millions of flowers in order to do that. So uh, Your area you can't guarantee what kind of resources there are within say a two mile three mile radius uh, of your house or wherever you're going to keep your bees so all you can do is get the bees, see how they do, and, and monitor their uh, health and the amount of honey that they have in the hive and how well they're building and growing that hive. And if they're, uh, you know, doing great and, and filling up that hive fast, then you got great resource and, and uh, hopefully you'll have delicious honey. So anyway, that pretty much covers the basics. I hope this video was useful. If you find it useful, please, uh, comment subscribe let us know what you think and and give us feedback if there's other things you want us to do in the future uh, but like and subscribe uh, that's how you know you let us know that you like what we're doing and and that encourages us of course to keep doing it thanks for watching